What's a spindle rough and gouge and why would you need one? I'm going to show you. Hi y'all, welcome to my shop. My name is Mike Peace and I'm here to share with you my tips, tricks and, and my passion for wood turning. Hopefully to, to teach you or inspire you or motivate you to get down to your shop and, and turn. Okay, what's a spindle rough and gouge good for? Basically it's for knocking off corners off, off square rectangular stock where the grain is running in the direction of the lathe. It's also useful for making long sweeping uh, flowing curves, for example on a tool handle. This is a perfect tool. It's also a tool of choice for many pin turners. Now, if you only turn bowls, you don't do any spindle work, you don't, you don't need this. Except for the following. Watch this. So this is only used for knocking off edges off a, uh, a, a blank where the grain, like I showed you, is running uh, parallel with the lathe bed. You never use it on a cross grain piece where the grain is running uh, perpendicular to the lathe bed as you'll typically do with a platter uh, and a bowl and it's because you're going to hit end grain which is very very hard uh, twice at every revolution. You're going to be cutting side grain, you might be okay, maybe, and then you're going to start hitting end grain right here on the inside of the bowl, I'm sorry, right here, and then when you come around you're going to get it again. You, this is a very large tool that generally is sharpened straight across. I'll get into more detail sharpening later. So it's very easy to get the wings caught. You're, you catch it out here, the fulcrum's here, you're going to get the mother of all catches. And it doesn't make any difference whether you're doing the inside of a bowl or the outside of a bowl. So if you're doing the outside of a bowl, you're still going to have the same situation. You might be cutting with side grain. You might be cutting straight across end grain, then you're going to be digging in to end grain right here at every other turn. In addition, the thing ha the, these spindle roughing gouges, with a few exceptions as I'll explain later, have a very weak tang. So there's two problems. Number one, it's too big uh, for the tool for, for the for the project. Number one, and then secondly, the tang is very very weak. You can see how the profile on the left is so much weaker than the round bar on a similar tool on the right. You might, be, you might have a bowl blank uh, that's got chainsaw marks on it as you're roughing it out, which makes it even worse for something to, to catch on to. These are typically forged with flat stock with a very small tang, as I show in the picture in the picture here for illustration and you compare that with a typical bowl gouge that's got a round shank much much stronger much more steel underneath the flute so again don't ever use this with a a, a bowl blank okay write this down because it's going to be on the quiz what's the cardinal rule of wood turning never get blood on the wood you use one of these spindle roughing gouges on a bowl and you got four possible consequences Number one, you could have a broken tool. Number two, you could have a broken tool rest. Number three, you could destroy your blank. And number four, you could break the cardinal rule of wood turning and get blood on the blank. Let me give you an example. Uh, I'm going to have a link in the show notes to a demonstration by a professional wood turner who is demonstrating the dangers of using this on cross grain work. He knows what he's doing. He knows why you don't do it. He was going to illustrate a catch, and guess what? He broke the cardinal rule of getting blood on the wood. I love the mass you get from a spindle roughing gouge that's got a round shank because it is it gives it just gives you tremendous uh, mass and and stability, and you're not going to break that thing. However, even though you might break it by trying to do it on a bowl. You could still, you might not get a broken tool, but you can still get a broken uh, tool rest. You can destroy the, uh, des destroy the blank. I should be showing a bowl blank. You could destroy the blank, and lastly, you most certainly can violate the cardinal rule of wood turning about not getting blood on the wood. So, if you only turn bowls, 
then you don't need one. If you got one, hide it so you don't accidentally grab it. But uh, it's a tremendous tool for doing, uh, an, I believe, an indispensable tool for doing spindle work. So if you're a bowl turner and that's all you're ever going to turn, hey, you can quit, quit watching the video go back to turning bowls. Now the spindle roughing gouge is distinguished from other other gouges because it because as I mentioned it's got uh, typically it's forged as shown in these pictures here with it where it's it's stamped or forged out of a flat piece of steel and it tends to have a, a, a small tang which which is weak but not a problem for spindle for spindle work uh, if you use it in accordance with what it was designed for and don't use it on cross grain cross grain work. So I like the ones with, with a bar stock, but they are pricey. They're not necessary, but they are very, very nice because they give you a tremendous uh, 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 strength. And typically, uh, I have not seen these in any uh, British tools. They tend to be tools made in North America. This one is by Carter & Sons. Uh, Thompson uh, Lathe Tools also makes one, and D-Way uh, Tools also uh, makes, makes one. All right, let's talk about using this thing. Okay, let's talk. Let's talk a little bit about about positioning. Uh, you want to stand with your legs old, maybe shoulder width apart. You're going to be dressing the lathe, and you're going to your your feet are going to be basically parallel with the, with the lathe. Typically, frequently, that's not the one I want. Uh, you you might have this on your hip, or you may not. But you're going to you're going to move this along the wood by moving your body back and forth. You're not going to be necessarily manipulating your hands. You're going to use your body by trying to keep your shoulders even and just just lean toward one side, drop down, come back across in the other direction, and you can go back and forth. Like I say, you can use the entire edge. You can cut it this way. You can roll this around. I'm still at a, at a 45 degree slice, but I'm using using a fresh edge. You can actually cut bringing it back. So I'm switching a, to a traditional spindle roughing gouge. This is one and a, this is about one and a quarter inch, but anywhere between three quarters and one and a quarter is uh, is a reasonable size. You're going to start with the tool rest. Generally, it's going to be somewhere. Uh, top of it about uh, center. Depends on your lathe height, depends on your height and how you to hold the tool. But generally when you start roughing, you're going to drop the handle down like this. Let me get you a side view. You're going to have the, the handle held down. You're going to be coming across with generally the edge flat to the work like this. Uh, initially, you're going to come off the blank You can, there's a couple of grips. You can do an underhanded grip like this. You can hold your thumb up if the chips are flying in your face. You can have an overhanded grip where you're pressing it down on the tool rest. Once you get the square edges knocked off, you can reposition the tool rest and get it closer. And you can also drop it a little bit so when you're cutting, you're going to start inclining the tool in the direction of the cut. And you're going to come off the wood. You never come from, from the tool rest onto the blank because you're liable to catch that corner, get a splinter, get a crack, and get some wood shrapnel. Always cut it off like that. You can always come back and, and change the shape on the in, inside, but you always come off. Come back in like that. Always have your tool rest extending at least an inch past the wood so you don't accidentally get off the edge and have it fall off on you. Now speed. This is a spindle. Very small. Here's an example of some guidance from Powermatic that, that I think is reasonable. You can turn spindles, smaller spindles, at a very high speed. You know if, you, if you're uh, turning pins where the blank's less than an inch, you're probably going 3,000 uh, RPMs. 
So for a two inch, uh, th three inch blank like this, you might get up to 1800. To, and, and you're gonna go a little slower as you're roughing it out. Once you get it round, uh, if you're changing the size, or you're doing a long profile, you can actually speed it up some. Also, once you get some clearance here, you get all the edges knocked off. I'm saving this square edge so uh, for something else I want to show you. But once you get it close, you can reposition your tool, tool rest because here's the fulcrum. You want lots of, lots of support. You don't want it hanging off the tool rest too far. Alright, let's talk just a little bit about flute flute profile. I'm going to show you some pictures of some, some uh, profiles, but typically the spindle roughing gouge has a U-shape to it. Uh, you want to sharpen it straight across like this. You don't want to sharpen it, um, let me get you another one. You don't want it with a rounded profile because that's not going to give you the same kind of results that you're going to get with it straight across. One of the advantages of straight across, it is so easy to sharpen. I'll show you how to do that in a moment. But you have that, you can actually use the full bevel from one sharpening by just rotating the tool to, to a fresh edge. You can't do that as easily with, with uh, a rounded uh, edge tool. The other thing you can do is, if you have this in your hand, you can take a peeling cut with this. And here's an example of a peeling cut where you bring it up where this cutting edge is this, this cutting edge is actually perpendicular to the wood, like this. And you're taking the same kind of cut that you would take with a, uh, with a skew or a beading and parting tool. So, for example, you could be coming into a shoulder here and if you rotate this up, you can come down with that peeling cut. And get in there and, and square that, uh, that shoulder up. Let me show that again. Hang the tool, ride the bevel, lift the handle of the cuts, and go straight in. And you're going to get a, a, a square shoulder without having to change tools. Now, you can always check to see if your tool is round by seeing if it vibrates or bounces where it does. So that means you gotta gotta keep on going before you get the edges, the edges uh, completely round. Now, because of that, that C shape, the fulcrum is going to be wherever it rests on the tool rest. So if it rests in the middle, um, you've got to be real careful. If you were coming in here, if you had this tilted like this, let me see if I can get you a little closer view. If you're coming in straight in, your fulcrum is right under the cut, in line. But if you rotate the tool like this, your fulcrum is now at an, at an angle further off. So if you get this wing caught in here, it's going to roll over, it's going to snap it over, and you're, you're going to get a catch. So you want to keep the cutting edge underneath the area supported on the tool rest. That's generally where most, most catches come from, is you're getting uh, an unsupported edge that's going to cause this thing to, to be pushed down like like that now once you get once you get your blank round that's when you're going to start inclining it in the direction of the cut so that you can get a slice and you can get a really fine edge for example you can actually we can see the shavings that are going to come off of this because you're going to get a nice curl shaving like, like that. 
if you come continue to go straight in, you're just going to get a more aggressive cut, and the shavings are not going to be nearly nearly as lot, nice. The surface is not going to be nearly as nice. So once you get it, the, the corners knocked off, start inclining, and you're still going to have the cutting edge uh, supported by the tool rest. In case there's some confusion on on the uh, flute flutes from left to right there's a typical spindle roughing gouge, a spindle gouge, and a deep fluted bowl gouge. Okay, let me give you some tool buying advice and you know this is my opinion uh, based on my experience and research other people may have differing views and, and I think maybe there's, their views are valid to them based on their experience. Um, but First, let's talk, talk about size. Typically, these things come in, in a size anywhere from three quarters to maybe one and three eighths. Uh, I've, got, I've got a Harbor Freight, uh, which is one inch, and it's actually a little bit less than that when you measure it from corner to corner. But, but I find this to be a fairly convenient size. Um, it's cheap Chinese, but it works. Uh, the steel's probably not quite as good. Might have to sharpen a little bit more. My general tool buying advice is buy the best you can afford and cry once, but I would have to say that on, probably on the spindle roughing gouge you can get by with, you know, even even this this uh, less expensive Harbor Freight. Again, this the one that's got more of a, a U-shape rather than the, than the, than the flat one. And, and you can make, you, you may be able to make do with that. A lot of that depends on how much spindle work you do. Uh, the, the other one is Chinese, but it's not cheap Chinese. It's a woodcraft tool. It's uh, about one and one eighth, and it's heavier. I think the biggest difference between these two is not so much the size across, but just the mass, and, and mass is good. Uh, one of the tools I really like is one that was gifted to me by Carter and, and Sons, full disclosure, I didn't pay for this. Uh, it, it's very heavy. Uh, it's got a very polished flute as opposed to the cheap Chinese as shown in this picture here where you've got these mill marks uh, and that prevents it from getting uh, as sharp at the edge and it's tough to polish those things out. Uh, this is very heavy because it's got that, that round, it comes from a round bar so it's got a round shank, very strong. Uh, I, I, one thing I don't like about it though is the way it's milled. It's not milled uniformly like like the typical one and as a result when you go to sharpen it it takes a lot of grinding in the middle because there's so much more steel there to get it to, uh, to go uh, straight across and if you're not careful you can bring the wings back because there's so much less steel on the side but it's got a lot of mass I, d I do enjoy uh, using it. If you get a cheap typically a cheap Chinese set but it could be some some other you might wind up with gouges that have a rounded tip. You might have two of them and not really have a spindle roughing gouge. Uh, this is a b better example from, this, from the same set. Uh, Richard Raffin says if your set comes with one that's kind of a uh, not as much of a C flute but kind of flat more like a continental gouge take the widest one and grind it straight across and then you'll get most of the benefits of, a, of that that design spindle roughing gouge where you grind it straight across. Uh, and you can make do with this for a while. So even thickness, such as the cheap Chinese and the more expensive uh, 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 Chinese is my preferred. Now you can get some really bad designs out there. This is a cheap Chinese from, believe it or not, Highland Woodworking uh, Bodger set, which is absolute rubbish design as shown here. It is so thin up on the edge, you can't grind it straight across no matter what you do. There's so little steel out here at the end, it just kind of kind of melts away. Uh, and the, these are just, just, just terrible. <laughs> what can I say? My club threw these away. That's why I have one. I pulled it out of garbage because we replaced it with a better quality, better design uh, spindle roughing gouges. Now the spindle roughing gouge is one of the easiest tools to... To, to sharpen. Basically you're going to use your your platform to sharpen it. Could be you might have a Wolverine system or some, something similar. Uh, I've got this fancy uh, aftermarket rest I bought from uh, 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 Robo Rest which is no longer manufactured but it makes it easy for you to replicate the the angle. The closest thing to this nowadays is the, uh, the Kodiak uh, by Wood Turner's Wonders. 
An easy way to set that angle for repeatability is simply cut you a piece of wood with a 40 degree angle here, put the base on it and where it just touches, not at the bottom but, but uh, maybe a quarter inch above that where, you, where your tool is going to cut it. Touch the wheel. So the question is what angle do you sharpen this at? Typically you want to keep it pretty close in the neighborhood of, of 45 degrees. Uh, you know, a few degrees either either way is going to be fine. The closer you get to 40, uh, the, the sharper it will be, but it, it's going to be a little more grabby, and, and the edge could be a little more grabby, but mostly the edge is going to be a little bit uh, uh, fragile. That might be appropriate if you're doing a lot of pine. If you're doing hardwoods, you might want to go a little bit more toward 50. Uh, you won't get quite as nice a cut, but uh, you won't have to sharpen as long because the uh, the edge is going to be a little bit, a little bit tougher. Now, uh, one thing, for some spindle roughing gouges, you have a curve. Uh, it's a little bit rounded here on the edge. I don't have one like that to, to, to show you. Uh, if you do, you want to flatten that area. These are already flat, so once you, you round it here, you've got a nice sharp edge you can get into that that corner I was telling you about, but if it's rounded over, you're not going to have it as sharp. So here's how you handle that. You're simply going to take it by hand, come up to the very edge here, and, and just rock it back and forth so you get it nice and, and flat right there. This one's not rounded over, but I'll give you an example. So you wind up with a very nice sharp edge all along that edge right there in the corner when you come in to take that, that shoulder peeling cut. You can see those shiny edges at, at the corner where you're, you're going to just get, you know, a sharp, a sharp edge of two planes meeting and you're going to have, have all those planes meeting when you do it that way. So basically you're going to roll this up on its edge where if you put your thumb on it, let me get this out of the way, and before I get into that, let me show you one other little little thing here. Never, ever use the, uh, the, the rod and, and pocket to sharpen this. It looks like it works. You might see instructions for that, but it's, it, you run, you're running a risk that it, should this slip, this, or the wheel, uh, if you're pressing too hard and and the wheel catches on it. Uh, it's going to force this thing down and if you've got aluminum oxide wheel there's a chance of shattering the wheel and having it explode. If it's a CBN uh, wheel there's a, it's just not designed to take the rigors of you taking a corner and po poking it into it as hard as you can and you could uh, permanently damage that wheel. So you're never going to turn one like this. You're always going to use the platform. So it's got a U-shaped flute, so put your thumb on it and just press it down flat and that shows you how far over it rolls. You don't roll it straight up and down because then you're going to wind up bringing the wings back. And as we said earlier, you don't want to bring the wings back, you want it straight across. Then you also don't want to hold the tool from back here on the handle because you can have a tendency to rock it and leverage it. You want to keep your hand, hand up here and maybe even can use your use your thumb to help support it to keep it flat because you don't want this thing rocking. So here's an example. When it comes to the other side, use your thumb to, to stop and and then once you do that a few times with your thumb, you'll understand how far to roll it over to get that nice nice sharp edge. I didn't get this uh, bevel set exactly, so it's taking me a little bit longer for this 180 grit wheel, which is what I use for most of my fine sharpening. Some people like a finer grit. I have not moved up to a finer grit yet, but I think I might. And then you get a very nice, no facet uh, shine all the way along. Some people go to the trouble of putting a dowel with a little piece of uh, fine sandpaper, maybe 240, and, 
and and knock the burr off I generally don't don't bother to do that okay so you don't have a spindle roughing gouge or whether maybe you do I'm going to show you some uh, alternatives that might be appropriate for you in some instances especially for blanks less than two inches you can take one of these things down very easily with a peeling cut with a skew I just drop down on your legs a little bit lift up Using your, your knees as a shock controller, you just drop down, and then you can come back later for that planing cut. I've seen other folks advocate using a bowl gouge because they say they use a bowl gouge for 98% of what they turn. Uh, I would say they don't do the same kind of turning I do because a uh, bowl gouge just can't do fine, sp fine spindle work. It's, it, it's just not, it's designed for bowls, spindle gouge designed for spindles. But you can ride the bevel, lift this, roll, slowly roll it down till it engages, come along and you're going to get that same slice and cut. You're going to get just as good a cut, but this is a more difficult tool to sharpen. In addition, if you want to come back in the other direction, you've got to switch hands, bring this back in the other direction, and, and turn left-handed, which is hard for some people. Or you're sliding it back and forth. But it's just not going to be as effective a tool, not going to be as efficient. But it can be done. I hope you're finding my, my turning uh, videos uh, helpful to you. I found an online application that allows you to buy me a virtual cup of coffee, so it, it, it's not expected, it's not required, but it's certainly appreciated if you want to support my channel. By I'll have the link in the, in the show notes on this video and other videos going forward. I welcome your questions and comments. I read every, every one of them. I don't always do written replies, but I'll try to answer every single question. Y'all stay safe. Come on back here.